This goes on every Monday. Would you mind filling up this third row and fourth row? Please come down. Those last row, move down, all three of you, four of you. There are five, six seats right here and over there. There are three seats near the aisle. You don't have to climb anywhere. Would you mind coming down? I still, okay. You're going to ask questions and you're way up there. Isn't it nicer if our guest speaker who is an extraordinary uh, man with uh, knowledge and information to experience to pass on to you to help you. He's a very busy man. He has to leave at five o'clock and he's, he gave up his valuable time to be here. Now, to respect him, come down, fill, a, fill these empty seats. Way down here. Way down. You, down, down, right here. You see those three seats over there? The second row, three empty seats, not there. Three empty seats, second row. You too. And you're not supposed to drink, not here. Go over there, the empty seats. And this girl coming in, come down to the first row, please. Both of you. I don't want to spend time reseating you because I'm anxious to start and introduce a very special guest speaker that you're very blessed to have him here. No, no. Fill those empty seats up there in the second row. <sighs> That's it. Okay, slightly better. Okay. I'm sure there'll be a few more of us coming in. But I'm anxious to respect Mr. Stuart Goldblatt's time because he, he will uh, show his PowerPoint, which has very, very precious. Uh, the, uh, miss, the, this row, second row. There are plenty of seats there, three of them, two of them. Go ahead. You can move over so she has. Come down here, young lady in the striped outfit. Okay. Way down, lower. Not in that last row. Come down here. There are five seats over there. One, two, three, go up the third row, here, go in there. Yes. Put your bags under the seat so people can get by. And this last student up there just coming in, two of you, come down to the third row, to the third row down here. I'm anxious to start this class. Third row, right there. You see the three seats? Put your bags under so she can get there. Good, better that you move. Okay, now that I've made a grouchy teacher of myself, we'll pass on to something wonderful and helpful to you for your future at a time when uh, the industry is very tight and you're all going to graduate and try to get uh, pr work in this industry. So you better listen to Mr. Goldblatt because he, he can tell you a lot. 
Come down. No, not there. Down, down. You're going to ask questions, so come down close. Come down here. Second row, right there. Second row, there are two seats. Right in there, right in here. You can move over if you want to. Now you're talking. Now you look beautiful. Now I'll be proud to have Mr. Goldblatt come up here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I was so excited and so proud when Mr. Goldblatt agreed to come and speak to us. As you know, he's the executive vice president of Macy's Private Brands Group. He will tell you more about his career, which you have to know. He's the executive vice president of Private Brands, as I said, men's, young men's, boys, children, and Macy's Private Brand Group, and a dual a fiduciary responsibility for all private brands, which is the big area today in marketing and merchandising. All segments of this process report to Stuart M. Greenblatt. Design sourcing, planning, shop design, store planning, and brand management. That's a big order, and he is the best at it, including advertising and store, coordinators and marketing. He's a graduate of Montgomery College in Maryland uh, in communication arts. And he can tell you more. I, I don't want to take more time, but this is the highlight of the power of his knowledge that comes to you. I think we should give him a big hand and thank him. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is everyone to move to the upper deck and spread out as much as possible. That's all right. Um, okay, so I'm going to give everyone something to think about today, and then maybe you can answer it afterwards. But um, everyone's familiar with the Miss Universe and Mr. Universe contests. And I would like to have the answer to this question after my presentation, if anyone can, and explain to me why the winner is always from Earth. Okay, that's a good one. Um, Miss Universe. Okay, we're, we're going to get started. I really want to break this into, into three parts. The first being, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and my career. The second, we're going to talk a little bit about how we take a new process which I'll call the new normal, into a speed to market process to get goods to market faster and some of the impediments to that. So uh, first of all, when I was in, I grew up in New York City and uh, I went to college at Maryland, University of Maryland Montgomery College. And uh, while I was there, I worked at the Heck Company full-time, part-time. Heck Company is now Macy's, but at that time it was a local department store. And uh, what was great about it is that it was, gave me a very flexible uh, way to make money to pay for school. And in those days, um, my uh, credit load at 21 credits, and uh, the, uh, it was $20 a credit to uh, pay for school, which was expensive when you were making $1.65 an hour. But anyway, um, so that's a long time ago. And we fast forward uh, today. I'm not going to bore you with the good old day stories because we're going to talk about the new norm and how we're going to move forward. So all through high school, I mean all through college, I worked uh, at the Heck Company. And uh, when graduation came, I asked for a day off. And my boss was, uh, what do you want a day off for? And I said, well, I'm going to graduation. And then about an hour later, the human resources person, which we call today talent management, we don't call it human resources, but in those days it was called personnel. So the personnel manager calls me and said, you know, it'd be really great to get you into our training program now that you're finished with school. How would you like to do that? And I said, I'm not really interested in that because I'm a communication arts major and I have an internship with the Washington Post radio station as more on the business side, not, not uh, spinning records or anything. 
So um, I said, no, but you know, I would like to continue work through the summer. And uh, after the summer, I will start at my new job and maybe I can still work here part time. Well, I got a phone call from the Washington Post uh, saying, actually, I, they didn't call me, I called them. I said, when does this start? They said, well, it'll start in September. Then September, we'll call you with the date. They never called me, I called them back. We moved it to November. So this was 1979, a very similar time frame as today because there was a big recession going on in uh, the US. And that's what capitalism does. You know, you have big recessions when you have capitalism. And uh, so I went back to my personnel director and I said, okay, now I would like to uh, work through October because this has been moved to November. I called the end of October and uh, they moved it to January. So uh, the, I went to the personnel director and she said, well, why don't you join our training program? We have another training program in January that starts. I promise you there's an end to this story. So. Uh, I said, okay, I'll take the job, pays $8,000 a year, and then when I get the job with the Washington Post, when that comes through, I'll just blow this off, and I'll say, oh, this was a terrible mistake, I didn't mean to do this, and uh, I'll just go on my merry way. Well, anyway, in the meantime, I got bitten by the retail bug, and the Washington Post never called me back, and uh, so I stayed in the, uh, in the training program, but I would still call every three months and just say, you know, gee, is that job open? Is it open? Is it open? And they would say no. And then finally, they stopped taking my calls. I had a restraining order. And uh, that was the end of that. But uh, so, you know, fast forward 30 years and I'm here with you. And uh, I'm very glad to be here with you. And uh, just to share a little bit of information that uh, I never regretted the fact, well, maybe I call once a year now to see if that job's open because you just, you know, you get fed up at your job and you say, I've had enough, I'm not taking this crap anymore, so you want to move on. But um, uh, the job is not open, and, uh, but I, they told me I'd be the first one they call when it is. So um, let me just talk to you a little bit. I'm here to talk about how, how do you take product and you market it. And marketing is really just a fancy word for selling. And what we all need to do is to learn how to sell things because we're in, I'm in the garment business and I'm selling things that nobody needs because nobody in this country needs a shirt, a pair of pants, a new suit or anything. And not only they don't need it, they have about 500,000 places to buy it from. So um, it becomes a pretty complex type of maneuver to get customers and we are consumer driven economy that uh, to get them to come into your store to buy your merchandise so everyone says well it sounds a little frivolous you know your job is selling blouses and sweaters and jackets but there are commodities at Macy's just as a uh, people in the financial business would sell uh, futures in corn or futures in coffee or shares in GE, it's the same thing. We're selling futures of blouses and skirts and we have to guess right of what the customer wants and that's a pretty tricky scenario. So the best way to sell more of things is to do it quickly. And I am not well versed in this subject of speed to market. Uh, what you see up here is our uh, PowerPoint of our four priorities. And um, we'll get into that a little bit later if we have time. But my computer has been locked by somebody. So let me control alt and delete. And uh, probably didn't realize I could do this. Okay. No, uh, I'll be the sound. Yeah, I'll be the sound. So we have the red screen. So we're talking about speed to market. And did everyone get nervous when the screen didn't come up and it was locked? And I got a little nervous, so I want to tell you. Okay, so uh, speed to market. And uh, the, the reality is, or the conversation is, are you part of the reality or, or part of the rhetoric? And speed to market is a conversation that we have. We have to do things faster. What is the new normal? And um, I'll just give you some examples again. Um, as uh, Abraham Lincoln said, 
you know, sometimes it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. So uh, I'm not a real pro at this, so I'll give you my best insights. So speed to market has kind of become this, uh, this catchphrase for all things current. It's kind of the answer to all questions. So if the question is, how are you going to fix your business? And people say, oh, speed to market. That's how we're going to fix our business. Or uh, what will make your business better? Speed to market. You know, we'll get things there faster. Or what, is the cu what, what do the customers need? Well, speed to market. That'll, you know, fix everything. And what is the difference between companies that succeed and that do not succeed? Speed to market, right? The ones that can get it there faster are the ones that succeed. So in the next 20 minutes, uh, you know, you'll realize there's little need to use the phrase unless you have a plan. So the goals are to set steps that are supported by successful examples. We're going to help us understand the motivation to make the ideas a reality. And uh, to help this great industry of ours has given us the opportunity to get together, to help them do things better because our industry needs a lot of help and it's good to see so many people anxious to get into it. So the time to hesitate is through. All the conversation's over. We have to fix what is broken. And how long should it take? So here's a perfect example. If we all got uh, all of our savings together and we wanted to buy a 777 from Boeing, okay, so we'd need about uh, $350 million. And uh, actually you only need $35 million and then you can lease it and then the bank will take it over and they will actually buy it and then you lease it back from them and then, then the economy collapses. Okay, so, uh, so if we did all that, it would take us 20 weeks. So we collect the uh, $350 million, we call it in, we say to Boeing, we want a 7, uh, 777. This is a 7, you can tell because it only has two engines on it. Um, 747s have four engines on the wings, in case you wanted to know that. And um, so it would take 20 weeks. Okay, now something much more difficult is I need a shirt on my selling floor. If you could design it for me, uh, how long will it take to get there? Well, the national average is 43 weeks of all U.S. retailers. So from the time that it's the conception of that item to the time it's delivered is 43 weeks. So we have a lot of work to do. When you can build a 777 faster than you can have a shirt with a nice little print on the front delivered, you're in trouble. Okay, uh, this is, uh, the source on this is on the bottom if you want to check me out. It's all been uh, ombudsmaned to death. Okay, um, so why speed to market? Of course, nothing really happens till somebody sells something. So what happened is we went along our merry way, taking a year to make product and deliver it to the floor, and then all of a sudden Zara came to the scene and was able to do it faster. So the fact that they are able to sell a lot of something and do things faster, everyone else had to respond. So speed to market is the number one challenge. We need to own trend and be the customer's first choice. That's what Zara's uh, mission statement says. And a need for a process to be in place in order to execute speed without sacrificing integrity, which means quality and what your mission of delivering pr product is to the floor. Okay. Okay, things do not change, we change. So uh, that was said by Henry David Thoreau. And um, when we say change, we have to change. We have to increase the speed and flexibility that we offer to the customers. We have to do things faster, and we have to listen to the customer and be flexible to respond to them. Have the right product at the right time. Well, that sounds like pretty standard operating procedure. And reduce the risk of having the wrong product. Everything is highly leveraged now. Things have to be delivered quickly. They have to be what the customer wants. And we have to speak to the customer more. And that's what we say marketing to the customer is giving them what they want. And we have to, with speed to market, be able to respond to the market shifts that take place in, within your competitive framework. 
Okay, so uh, we'll get a little heavier here with Mohandas Gandhi, who's, uh, you won't believe this, but he used to spin his own yarn. That was one of his statements that he made, that he was self-sufficient, and he used to spin his own yarn and make his own clothes. And if we all really want to see the change, we got to take the change on ourselves. We need relationships with partners, vendor partnerships, that are going to be able to give us the flexibility that we need. We need a supply base optimization. And I'll get into that in a little while about what Toyota does and how sophisticated they are, or even Zara and how sophisticated they are versus what we do today. And integrated information system, which is a product life management. And we'll talk about that like right now. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Don't complain. Okay, so that sounds like Alice is yelling at you right now, right? Stop complaining. Well, that's the reality of it because that doesn't solve anything. And uh, it's good to be able to identify an issue or a problem. But really, you have to focus on the solution. And uh, so product life management does that. It's from the beginning to the end, from womb to tomb. Or in the Army, they say factory line to front line. This is all planned. This is all figured as a front to end responsibility for all product categories. And um, the definition for product life management is a holistic approach which eliminates redundant activities, improves communication, and speeds the development cycle. This can be used for whether it's a college or whether it's developing product. This is an important approach to develop flattened communication among many different levels of business. So now we're all going to think like Einstein. And uh, what Einstein said is there's nothing is more certain sign of insanity than to do the same thing over and over and expect the results to be different. All of us have heard this, but we still do things the same way over and over again because it's what's familiar. So breaking the mold becomes a very, very difficult aspect of being able to understand how to change things. So we have to refocus, we have to think differently. And the greatest difficulty in the world is not for people to accept new ideas, to, but to make them forget about the old ideas. So everyone's willing to incorporate new things that they will do, but they're not willing to change what they're doing. So the perfect example of this is when, you know, 10 years ago, email came on board, and there were people, you have to go on email, you can't not be on email, that's the way the world is going to be. Um, and what a lot of people did was they would print all of the emails, write notes on the bottom of them, give them to their assistant to respond back to the email. Well, that's not really a good solution to new technology. But we have to forget about the old ways of doing things and understand the new way of doing things to be able to speak to the customer in a more efficient and clear manner. So the refocus is, uh, is really well said by J. Paul Getty, who uh, was able to make a few bucks in his lifetime. And if any of you were in LA, you should go to the Getty Museum. It's really fantastic. But in times of change, experience can be your worst enemy. So we're always saying, gee, you know, you need to talk to people who are experienced and have this great wealth of knowledge. Yes, that's important. But at times, that person can drag you back and start reminiscing about the good old days, the way things were done. And really, the purpose that we're here for is to find new ways to do things faster and quicker and to speak to the customer in a more efficient way. So for uh, you math folks out there, we're going we're gonna, to, uh, I have my blackboard, my virtual blackboard. We have a uh, new technology, which is changing as we speak every second, getting faster and faster and more and more accessible to more and more people. So we bring that into an organization that is 150 years old, like Macy's, 150 years old. So we have all this new technology, and we have all these kids, and you know, we still have people who are printing their emails so that they can respond and have somebody else write back. 
And then you add that to an old organization that isn't set up to do things the new, fresh way and to adapt to the times. And what you end up with is an expensive old organization, which we'll call EOO. Now, this is a very dangerous place to be. And uh, right, if you look around the corner from EOO is bankruptcy, okay? So uh, sometimes experience can be an enemy. So here's the long view. By reclaiming the courage to manage in the age of instant answers, there has to be a long view. There has to be a strategy. You can't be responding just to quarterly earnings and what's new out there. And this is, this is what happens in, in uh, our business and why we have to change our way of doing business as far as getting product 43 weeks to get product to the floor. So design, the designers are out there designing away. Alice was out there designing many years ago uh, and actually one of the great designers of all time, Alice Papazian, um, if you didn't know. But uh, so she'd be designing away, and then she sends it off to the, uh, the vendor to have them take a look at it. And the vendor sends it back to uh, the product manager who takes a look at it, and they don't really like what the vendor did with it. They'll send it back to the vendor. The vendor will make some changes and get back to the designer and say, you know, gee, the colors aren't right, or you want a 12 color, and I can only do an eight color sends it back to the vendor with the eight colors, sends it to product, product sends it on to technical design, says, listen, we have some crocking on the uh, red and uh, the blue isn't coming out. It goes back to product. So meanwhile, this is going round and around and we're not even talking to the customer who, who's up there who's shopping. We don't know what she wants because we're working a year out. We're not speaking to the customer. We're not getting her vote. She comes in and votes in our store every day. So. This communication just goes around and around, and this is nothing that is new, where people do things in their silos, don't listen to what the recommendations are, or have no respect for the thought process that is uh, being engaged by the creative side of the business, which really drives the business. So uh, just to give you an example of uh, how long this has been going on, I have a clip from a movie from 1942 that'll give you a kind of an idea of uh, this thought process. Yeah, we'll talk about the painting. Okay. I had some samples. Oh, here we are. Now, first the living room. I want it to be a soft green. Uh huh. Not as blue green as a robin's egg. No. But not as yellow green as daffodil buds. Uh huh. Now, the only sample I could get is a little too yellow. But don't let whoever does it go to the other extreme and get it too blue. No. It should just be a sort of grayish yellow green. Uh huh. Now, the dining room. I'd like yellow. Not just yellow, a very gay yellow. Something bright and sunshiny. Uh huh. I tell you, Mr. Padelford, if you'll send one of your workmen to the grocer for a pound of their best butter and match that exactly, you can't go wrong. Uh-huh. Now, this is the table we're going to use in the hall. It's flowered, but I don't want the ceiling to match any of the colors of the flowers. No. There's some little dots in the background, and it's these dots I want you to match. Not the little greenish dot near the hollyhock leaf. No. But the little bluish dot between the rosebud and the delphinium blossom. Is that clear? Uh-huh. Now, the kitchen is to be white. Not a cold antiseptic hospital white. No. A little warmer, but still, not to suggest any other color but white. Uh-huh. Now, for the powder room, in here, I want you to match this thread, and don't lose it. It's the only spool I have, and I had an awful time finding it. As you can see, it's practically an apple red. Somewhere between a healthy wine sap and an unripened Jonathan. Uh -huh. Oh, excuse me. You got that, Charlie? Red, green, blue, yellow, white. Check. She was uh, taking a little too far, but uh, obviously 
he wasn't listening and knew what he was going to paint the house anyway. So uh, that, uh, that creates constant friction when people want to change things and do things differently. Obviously, that painter wasn't doing anything differently. Okay, so we're going to move on. And um, the difference, and this is real in Built to Last, which is a famous uh, business book, and you could be reading business books for the rest of your life, and they constantly change. And, you know, In Search of Excellence was a great book, and all the companies that they uh, cited as excellent examples of success within 10 years all failed. So, um, you know, that, that's why constantly evolving and constantly understanding what the customer desires are and that that is uh, balanced with commerce and creativity and commerce, the companies that invest in research and development and have a balance of, of uh, commerce and creativity are the ones that succeed. So what ends up happening here is that in Built to Last, James Collins said the difference between successes and failure is research and development. So the whole thing about the Prius wasn't one day Toyota woke up and said, how am I gonna save the earth? that had nothing to do with what they wanted to accomplish. What they wanted to accomplish was sell more cars, and they realized within their study of the market and speaking to consumers that they wanted cars that were technologically advanced and used new ways of saving gas and wanted them to take a leadership role. So, they developed the Prius, which is uh, part electric, run by gas. But it was never because they wanted to save the world. It was because they wanted to save, uh, to sell more cars. Their goal now, in uh, by 2025, is to be the leading car manufacturer of non-petroleum cars. That's their goal. They're not. Uh, they're not focused on well. How do I make the Prius prettier? And how do I make uh, other? cars that are run like the Prius, their goal is to, how do I make cars that don't run on gasoline? So they're way ahead. They're spending $20 million a day on research and development. And uh, some time ago, um, the new chairman of General Motors said, if I do everything that Toyota does today, um, I will, in two years, I'll be as good as they are today. The only problem is Toyota will be two or three years ahead of them, so they're still going to be two years behind. Right now, they're about 10 years behind. But the, the reality is that the speed to market and understanding the customer and what they need is what's driving Toyota. And uh, you'll see some numbers up here, but uh, Toyota turns their cars every 27 days. That means how many days are on the lot. You can see some other numbers up here. Uh, that uh, Chrysler, I called it Daimler Chrysler, but GM's at 83 and Chrysler's at 107. So that is a significant difference when you're talking about a $30,000 car sitting on the lot for 80 days more than Toyota's cars sit on the lot. And the reason they're able to do this is because they took, undertook a strategy of working with their suppliers, as we mentioned earlier. So in their factories, Rather than they get an order from a, for a car, they have to notify the tire supplier, and then they have to notify the seat supplier and the battery supplier and the steering wheel supplier, and just think about all the things that the, uh, the coat hook supplier and the car, the uh, trunk latch supplier, and bring all of that in and orchestrate having that all made together. They uh, develop a strategy with their vendors where the vendors actually hold all of the necessary equipment in the, in the uh, warehouse, and then they build the car as they need, and the, the equipment in the warehouse that's used to build the car is paid for by the vendor, but it makes the much more efficient the uh, car building, and um, the American car manufacturers are not doing that and will soon be doing that, and uh, also Toyota was one of the first with robotics. Um, and just talking a little bit more about Toyota, where they're spending $20 million a day on research and development, is all about understanding what the customer wants, asking them what they want. And they're really the ones who 
uh, understood the customer wants this mass customization. So you go in and you can build, Skyon came from this, identified a younger customer who could come in and then build their own cars, or they think they're building their own cars. But the reality is, is that they're um, just putting their own finishes on it. Uh, same thing with M&Ms. You can go to M&Ms.com, you can order your own colors, and uh, this mass customization is really a trend that is going to continue to build over time. So uh, the next quote is, that which is honored is produced, and that was uh, Plato, some, somewhere between 428 and 348 BCE. And uh, when, when uh, Plato said this to me, uh, and I was paying close attention, but I wasn't obviously paying attention to the date, um, and, and really, what, what that means is that when people do things and when they manufacture things or produce things or have great thoughts or write a great book, that is when people are noticed and that is when things are honored. And certainly Toyota has taken the lead in developing the car business. And the reason I use the car business is similar uh, analogy to apparel because it is a fashion business. People focus on it. It is a utilitarian item, but you know, cars last a long time and people get rid of them, you know, two year lease, three year lease. Um, to, I have a car, one for seven years. I was sick of it four years ago. So um, the reality is, is that people like new cars. The United States used to sell 19 million cars a year. We'll probably sell 12 million, uh, level, level in about 12 million but uh, there's new models coming out all the time. So Chris Rock, one of my favorite, uh, besides Plato, one of my favorite philosophers, said, uh, don't take credit for things you're supposed to do anyway. So um, all of these things that we talk about, and we said, well, you know, I really did a great job. I turned in all my, uh, all my reports on time, and I did all my studying, and um, you know, I have a job, and I pay my bills. And so uh, Toyota says, you know, this is what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be providing jobs. They're supposed to be efficient. They don't want to take credit for it. They just want more customers to buy more cars from them. And um, they, they talk about how they, they uh, spend money redoing factories and things like that. But you can read all of this on the, on the uh, Internet. And uh, so how does this apply to uh, U.S. garment manufacture? Well, uh, Joseph Abood, who was manufacturing in the United States, took this on as a challenge and actually converted their factory in uh, New York to be much more uh, friendly towards uh, the Japanese thought process of, uh, of building and having uh, the factory workers actually running the factory. And it's become really a, a terrific success. This factory in Massachusetts where we say nothing is made in the US, it can work, but people have to change their thinking dramatically. And the, we have to give credit to the people at, at uh, Joseph Abood for thinking of this, Marty's staff, and uh, having their factory workers understand the need to change. Um, so some things really never change. This was written, and I'll just read it verbatim, but um, the customer comes to us in New England and California and New York and New Mexico and Wisconsin and Florida in all the diverse areas in the United States, and each of them has some need, some wish to be fulfilled. Some may know precisely what they want. Some may know generally. Some may come to us and ask us outright for help in finding a particular thing to solve a particular problem. So that's true today. And it was true in October of 1957, which um, basically says that, you know, customers come to us looking for things. We have to forge the way. If we don't, we will not be around. So um, you know, 20 years ago, Kmart and Walmart were the same size. They were the same size company. Uh, Walmart's goal is to be a trillion dollar company. So everyone says, uh, well, you know, how many people here shop at Walmart? Okay, you're all lying because I don't know how they do, you know, $500 trillion and nobody shops there. I ask that question in every single uh, room and nobody has ever been to Walmart. So, uh, 
it's uh, kind of an kind of an interesting uh, thing. So if, if you could not shop at Macy's, I would really appreciate that because uh, our business may be much better. Um, but what happens is that companies, uh, Walmart has done three things really well. They understood the value metric, they understood the grocery metric, and they uh, understood the uh, ability to, on the back end of the business, flatten out all of the logistics and getting goods to stores quickly. Um, and uh, all of those things, you can't do just one of them. They uh, have a third of their business uh, is in, um, in groceries. So the supermarkets are competing against them pretty aggressively. In uh, Whole Foods, does anyone know how much in Whole Foods of what they sell, the percentage is organic? Does anyone know that? 100%? No, not a, it's either 100% or not 100%. Okay, okay, we got to zero in on this a little bit. We got 20%? Okay. All right, 18% of everything they sell. So whoever said 20% is right. So you would never know that by Whole Foods, um, but uh, that's, that's the reality. So they understand that, gee, you know, people want healthy things, uh, healthful things, but they also want Haagen-Dazs ice cream. Okay. So in conclusion, and this was said by Jim Barksdale, who started Netscape, which probably nobody really knows what Netscape was, but it was the first internet browser. And uh, through fantastic idea to have an internet browser, and uh, just proves that when something is badly managed that it will go by the wayside. But he said, uh, which he didn't pay attention to, by the way, he said the main thing is to make sure the main thing stays the main thing. So you have to stay focused on what, we're, what you're doing. This presentation was about speed to market, and we could talk about this for a long time. We have to change to get goods on the floor closer to the need. Uh, you must change, we must change. Uh, so the question is, are you part of the reality of speed to market? And stay focused, okay? So the last slide is thank you. Uh, we are at uh, 50, 450. So um, questions? Yes, 20%, 20% whole food person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, really, we have four main things, so that's probably the, uh, the, uh, the problem. We call them the four priorities. And really, it goes into every decision-making process. And it's number one, to have, uh, to have clear assortments, uh, simplify the pricing. So clear fashion assortments, we do okay. Uh, simplify pricing, we're terrible at. Uh, the third is um, a, um, a shopping experience that's superior. Not so good at that. And then the fourth is compelling marketing, which I think we, get, we do pretty well. And, um, but that goes into every decision that, that we make. And the main thing there is to get better at all of those things in a very difficult retail environment when all kinds of pressures are, are taking place. Did that answer your question? OK. OK. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what happens is uh, we, we have really a three-part process. We take a position on, on fabric. And uh, Mr. Reed actually taught me this many years ago. We take a position on fabric and we test many different washes, many different fits, and we put them in separate locations. And then we let the customer decide. And if the customer's deciding on Monday and we give it two weeks that they prefer the boot cut 11 inch rise with the uh, whiskering 
and uh, the baking on the knee and the twisted seam, that they like that one. If it takes us 43 weeks to get it on the floor, they've gone somewhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That, that that's part of it, and now we're down to um, we're down to uh, six weeks out of Mexico. So once we get that selling, that initial selling, we can go back. All of that done. The tech pack is done. The fabric sitting there. Everything is there. We give them uh, sizes to cut into. We blocked out production in the factory, so they know they're getting something. They don't know exactly what they're getting. It doesn't matter. We've uh, blocked out production in the uh, laundries. And so we're able, really in six weeks, to get a reading on that and get it cut and shipped by truck into uh, New Jersey from there. Well, it goes rail and then by truck. So if we didn't have all of, if we didn't take all of those positions, we used to, we used to just uh, make goods and sell them in. And if that other style that was selling better uh, we would just say, okay, well, we'll get that next year, or we'll do more of that next year. Customer isn't willing to wait. The it's moving quickly, so um, that, that's why it matters. We bring in more that we know we will be able to sell at a higher margin and uh, be able to turn through it faster and also be able to afford to test some other ideas. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right, right. Well, the, uh, the, this is how Zara works. They're very, uh, you know, they plan the speed to market. So what happens is they have a container out of China. And the container in China uh, has the fabric in it, the patterns in it, has the fabric in it, the buttons, the labels, the zippers, all the findings, and it comes over in a container, uh, disassembled. They drop it in Bangladesh in a factory. They pull everything out of the container. They sew it as per the pattern. They put it back on the container. They take it, and they have to, they have, uh, I think, 10 days to cut the, the order or less goes back to the airport, goes on a plane, goes to the uh, warehouse in, uh, in Spain, and uh, then it's distributed. So they, they have a pretty quick turnaround. But, uh, but I, I've been in Zara, we're H&M, and you know, buttons are falling off, and, and, and we've, made a, we've made a concerted effort not to do that. So that's when part of the presentation is you, you can't sacrifice the integrity of the product just for speed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so whoever I, I, I actually worked for a really great, I was lucky, worked for great people who supported me. And uh, the only advice I would give you is find a mentor. Find somebody who will invest the time in you and if you have an attitude that, well, I'm just going to do my job and they should notice, and it doesn't necessarily work that way. Everyone in our business who's been successful um, has had a mentor who has brought them along. And uh, mine was a gentleman who I worked with right out of the training program, and he was a senior vice president at the time. But we started in Washington, in D.C., and then we moved to, uh, he moved to Hartford, Connecticut, G. Fox. You don't know when, these are all trivia questions. Uh, G. Fox, and I went with them there. And then he came back to New York to Lord & Taylor, and I came with him back to Lord & Taylor. So he is somebody who, the joke was I was carrying his luggage uh, wherever he went. But the uh, reality is, is that it had somebody who was looking out for you and challenging you, and, and uh, that was important. Any other questions? Yes.
Uh, well, uh, basically it all starts with, with design. And with design it starts with color, and then we silhouette, and then it starts to, um, we start to break it down from there. On the other side, the production group is saying, okay, the financial plan is so much, so that means we can buy 12 knit shirts and eight woven shirts and seven pants and three jackets, and they start to design into those, uh, those categories, so they're not over-designing. And we have review process right, you know, right, right through all of that. Yeah, no, we have a full design group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a full design group that just the private brand for, for Macy's. And that's the one area in the last 10 years when um, in, the, in 10 years we had nine designers for all of men's and we have almost 60 people in the design group now. So you need, you need pretty uh, comprehensive design area now for, for design and technical design. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yep, so it goes, it, uh, you know, designing is, uh, is obviously an art, and uh, being able to ma manage the design process is important because people need to be creative, and they also need to be uh, uh, measured so that they understand that as they're creative that it is also something that is commercially viable, and also not to be just designing to design, so there's a, there's, normally a very tight uh, window to design into, and then some very strong designers will come forward and say, this isn't enough, I need more plaids, and I need more, and then it goes through that, that whole process. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. You're wrong. It hasn't gone down a little bit. It's gone down a lot. Um, so the reality is, is that people, you know, I don't know anyone in here really thinks of department stores or not department stores. Uh, Mr. Alan Questrom, who's kind of an icon in the industry and retired for many years now, he said, you know, Walmart has more departments than Macy's. So um, it, it's really where people want to shop. I don't think people get in their car and go to the mall and say, I want to go to a department store today. You know, they're going for whatever they're shopping for. They need a jacket, they'll say, well, usually Macy's has a great, you know, and if I need milk, I'm going to Walmart. And um, that was, you know, we're jealous of Walmart. And Walmart really doesn't have apparel figured out. You know, they believe it's just commodity and price, and it's not, it's not that. And we also hope Walmart never figures out apparel. But um, the reality is, is that people have a point of view in mind, and and there's not a lot of loyalty to really any apparel stores for people 35 and younger. But uh, department stores, the market share of department stores as they're classified, Macy's, and um, is in half of what it was 10 years ago. It's, it was 18% of the total revenue. It's, it's about 10% uh, now. That's fact. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Forever 21 has figured out how to even make it faster. Because what they do is um, they just buy what's on the floor. See, Zara still goes through a process of, of adapting it into their <laughs> tech packs, uh, you know, their technical design. Uh, Forever 21 just takes whatever they see and they ship it over to one of their factories and say, make this as fast as you can, and then it comes back. So you have very inconsistent sizing and inconsistent colors and fits, but they, and lots of lawsuits. They have over 80 lawsuits of uh, other companies that have 
have sued them based on uh, stealing their designs. But um, uh, the reality is, is that's a faster way. But uh, and they're growing very rapidly, and they are on the trends faster. And they, plus, they have an eye. It's just kind of built into their system. Show me what's new and what's next. So, and a very vibrant testing system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a balance. We you know, a third of our business is replenishment, so that you know twenty five to thirty percent will always not change you know, fits and that type of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So private brand, what the, what the future uh, model is, you'll see retailers buying brands, which is what uh, JCPenney just did with Liz Claiborne. I mean, even though they're licensing it in five years, they'll own, they'll own the brand. So uh, we own some brands or have licensing agreements, whether it's Martha Stewart, uh, Exclusive Arrangement, American Rag, which is a specialty store in California, which we have an exclusive arrangement, Tommy Hilfiger. So that'll be the future of private brands where these brands will align themselves with retailers to have more of a vertical relationship um, because the existing wholesale retail um, economic doesn't really work anymore. There are just too many people touching it along the, along the way. What? One more question and then... Product development. Okay, so um, there's really three, there's really uh, three fr functions. There's design, there's product development, product managers, and then the technical design. The, the design is really what comes, the designer is purely creative in developing product that's commercially viable based on their instincts, trends, and ideas, and what's going on in the market. The merchandiser, the product manager, the product director is managing the business. Okay, so you're out here thinking, I'm telling you what's selling, and I'm telling you what's missing, and I'm telling you what does work and what doesn't work. So there's, uh, since the beginning of time, when Eve was the first designer and Adam was the first product manager, there's been this conflict and uh, they ate the apple anyway, and they, and you know how that ended. So um, there's, um, that's how that dynamic works. One's really the business manager and developing product, but it still has a creative role because they have to interpret the uh, selling and the design into future business opportunities. And then technical design, make sure that the, you know, the buttonholes are in the right place and that there's right slope on the shoulders and but that's more of a tactical part of the business. So one is uh, design is more ethereal and the product manager is more strategic and, and, uh, and uh, the technical design is tactical. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay till, the, uh, till fifth, uh, 10 after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and we have one here. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. And that seems to have been where this place was starting to learn to fly. Mm hmm. Yeah. When you left. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, uh, we were not. They offered that to us. And we passed on it. I know that for, for a fact. And uh, the reason was that we felt that the brand was a little bit too diminished. Yeah, to really rekindle because JCPenney had diminished that with their Liz & Co. brand. So uh, we, weren't, we weren't upset about... 
Yes, yes. At that point, it wasn't we didn't want it. They didn't offer it to us. They made an outside deal and informed us of it. Yeah, that's when, it, yeah, right, right. Other ways to spend our money. And there was one other question up here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is uh, customization, uh, mass customization is becoming more and more important. The customer's recognizing that. They're on the internet. They understand how to customize what they need, buy what they want. And we have a process in place which is called My Macy's, which is a process that has um, identified 69 different districts in the United States that um, they will have their own open to buy to allocate vendors, colors, sizes that uh, we weren't able to address before. We had divisions uh, before, four divisions, but we didn't have in the market 10 stores that were districts, and um, we didn't think of this. This is the Pizza Hut model. Pizza Hut was struggling about uh, five years ago, six years ago, and because they had very rigid guidelines on how they ran their business. So uh, they didn't allow for any changes to the menu. They had certain hours that they were open, and what was happening, they were losing market share to new chains or to local pizza parlors. And what they determined to do was to test localization because there was a pizza, uh, a, a pizza hut that the customers would come in and ask for pineapple and ham pizzas. And they said, well, we don't make those. And they would go somewhere else and never come back. So now uh, Pizza Hut put into place where they can have 15% uh, uh, of what they're offering is outside of the corporate menu. They have, um, they, you can change your hours, so if you're near a college campus, you don't have to close at 10 o'clock anymore. You can stay open 24 hours on Friday and Saturday. And uh, that became a big change to their dynamic on how they did business. We're taking that same model and addressing the uh, individual markets. And what we're finding, it's more about size and color than it is about, we can sell Hugo Boss in Fargo, North Dakota. It's more about, you know, we need more blue. The school he, colors are yellow and orange, which isn't a great combination, but you get my, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we have something on our website is tell us what you think. So after somebody buys something or they can't find something, they go and tell us what you think. And all of our designers, everyone reads that really weekly. Uh, and customers say, you, the, I have an ink jacket, it doesn't fit. I was in your store, I put on a uh, Alfani pair of pants. They didn't fit, I didn't buy them. So we encourage people to go to uh, tell us what you think. No, no, the manufacturers will do that, but uh, not on our website. Right, but we need to get there. We need to get there where somebody can go on our website, choose a fit, choose a, a fabric, choose a wash, and be able to buy their own jeans on, online. There's a great store if you, don't, if you have time. It's called Jean Shop. There's one on uh, uh, West Broadway. There's one on 14th Street next to Jeffrey. And they just have raw denim in the uh, store. And then you go and you pick out what wash you want, you do it on Monday, you come back Friday, you look great for the weekend, and uh, it's about $250 to do that, so. One week, come in Monday and Friday, they're washed and, and whiskered and. Okay, well thank you for your time, appreciate it. Okay, all right. Yes. yes. Yeah, I have. Uh, uh, no.